that right before I'm supposed to get up and talk to 400 people. <laughs> Thank you, sis. I love you. This is our first Mother's Day. Oh, my God, help me. Jesus, this is our first Mother's Day apart. <laughs> That's okay. I've got Caleb. He's here. He's going to make up for both of them. And why don't we just go to the, um, to the grand puppy and the dogs while we're at it. So my kids are, Caleb's here, and Caitlin's in Florida, but look. This is my Charlie. She had just come from the beauty shop. This is my grand dog on the left, Baker. He's a silver lab who is gorgeous. And um, our homeless dog that someone dropped at the church, the one that Brent always references, Jax, he's the one on the right. And this is typical of a every day for these two dogs. They're going to be on the one toy every day. And then my little old man, Snickers. <laughs> and Snickers has a bone in his mouth, not a cigar. So <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> He's like 13 or 14 years old, and he kind of rules the house. But uh, yes, yeah, so happy Mother's Day to all of you that are here. Um, we're, we're celebrating with you today and honored that you're here. Also, yesterday I was told was National Birth Mother's Day. And I want to just give a, a shout out that if anywhere along the line you, you gave a child up for adoption and allowed them to have a good full life, thank you for loving them enough to go that route. So we honor all the women and yeah, give all the ladies, we honor all ladies here today. We decided that a long time ago that we were just going to focus on all the women on this day. So it's tough living as a woman sometimes, but we got this and we can do it. Look at the screen real quick for another Mother's Day video for you ladies. Somebody better make you breakfast. And not just on Mother's Day. Don't you hate that since so the one day of the year they're nice to you? Do you know what I mean? I gotta tell you about last Mother's Day. My husband's like, what do you want? I'm like, you don't really know what I want, do you? I don't wanna tell you, I, I'm gonna be honest. He's like, just tell me what you want. I'm like, I want you and the kids to leave. That's what I want. birth and I am done son Caitlin I'm done that is not true whatsoever <laughs> y'all I showed you this clip because ladies this lady right here this comedian speaker that she's known all over the the world and does been on all kinds of talk shows and comedy central she is our guest speaker for our women's Christmas party this year and she will be coming and joining us in December. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. But she is really funny, and she has a great story of faith that goes along with all of her funny things. Okay, a few more things to get out of the way. Ladies, you always get a T-shirt when you come. And this is the shirt. And the shirt is also going to be on the screen, so you can see. With the little storm that blew in a few days ago, it knocked out power at the t-shirt shop and they could not complete the order. So they will be ready for you next week to pick up right here, free to you, that says steadfast, immovable, fixed, unwavering. And we'll talk about the little icon at the bottom at the end of the message because it has something to do with a bulldog and I just can't do it before I preach. We're going to do it at the end. And then the last thing I want to say that Brent asked me to um, 
bring to your attention is we will be welcoming a brand new youth pastor coming June 1st, the 1st of June. Yes, great things are happening. This is the little family, Jose Rivera, his wife Shana, two-year-old Hayden, and um, we are so excited to get them down here. Jose was here last week. He shared with our youth, and um, it was announced at youth, this great announcement, and um, I'm telling you, it's good, good things are coming in store. We're excited about this um, this new addition to our staff. So let's get right into the word. Um, get on page one. Two pages, that's all. It's a Christmas miracle. I also am wearing glasses that Brent doesn't approve of, but he's not here. So it doesn't matter if he approves or not. He doesn't like the sparkly stuff on my glasses, but he's not here to look at them. So we're wearing them. In the past, in our ministry lives, um, Brent has um, always had a real heart to go to the nations, go overseas on trips, just bring the gospel to the nations, worship with the word. And every once in a while, he had asked me if I shared that, I want to go on this trip, want to do this. And every single time, without fail, my answer is the same. Nope, I'm good. <laughs> That's not my heart. I really don't care to get on a plane and fly 18 hours across an open ocean. Um, you know, I, I love it. And my answer to him was, I'm going to stay here on the home front. I want to keep the home fires burning. I'll stay at the local church. And I'll teach all the Christians how to live in victory. You go save the nations, and I'm going to teach the Christians how to walk everyday life. And the funny thing about this is, is we did a Bible study in, in a spring semester, the women did, called It's Not Supposed to Be This Way by Lisa Turkhurst. Um, we had 12 groups doing it, and some of you went through that study, and you know that pretty much what I just said was the basis of that book. When life throws things at you that wasn't supposed to happen, it wasn't on your list of how you had planned your life to be, what do you do, how do you walk your life out, and your faith out. And as I was putting all this together this week, it dawned on me that the little answer that I gave Brent so many years ago, I'm just going to stay here and I want to teach people how to live in victory, was exactly the premise of that book. And in one of the chapters, um, it jumped out on, uh, of the book and off the page at me, and it was talking about the secret of being a steadfast person. And how do you walk with confidence every day when things happen, good things and bad things? And so that's what I really felt like God put on my heart to share. And I want to start with the definition of steadfast. It is on your note sheet. The first three are the words that I put on the shirt so that I want every time you wear this shirt and look at it, you will re be reminded to be fixed, immovable, unwavering, not subject to change, you're just going to be constant. Being steadfast literally means to be fixed in place, but it chiefly is used to indicate an undeviating constancy or resolution. Some people might say that's being hard-headed, <laughs> being stubborn, being resolute. And yes, I agree 100%. Now, as a kid, I was always tagged by my parents as being hard-headed. You're, you're Terry Lynn, you are so hard-headed. That's not a good thing when you're a kid and you're hearing it from your parent. But as I've grown older and I walk my faith out, the one thing I want the devil to know, that I am hard-headed and I am stubborn and I am resolute in my faith. And you are not going to, to move me. I will not waver. You cannot convince me when I go every day of my life where I face my problems, that what I know of this word, you cannot convince me it's not true and it's not gonna be active in my life because it is true and it is active in my life. So being hard-headed as an adult Christian is a good compliment that I, that I like to wear. Some people, they just, whatever you tell them, oh, that's a good idea. And this person will say something else. Well, that's a good idea, too. Well, that, there's a bird. There's a butterfly. Oh, look at that kitty cat. They are all over. No, you need to become resolute and unchanging. Be constant in your faith. So, steadfastness is a continuous and a progressive process. 
I don't think you just wake up one day and you're just able to walk through everything, just bam, I'm there, I arrived. It's a process and it's continuous. Anybody can walk it, everybody should walk it. So let's look at Hebrews 12, one through two. This happened to be the scripture that Lisa Turkhurst actually used in this one chapter that just knocked me off my feet for that day when I read it. And it says, do you see what this means that all these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. And here's, here's the key to being steadfast, this next line. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. And then he puts a little paraphrase right here and says that exhilarating finish in and with God. But I want to read it again and skip that little line. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, he could put up with anything along the way, including the cross, shame, or whatever. And here's the, here's the fulfilled promise. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. See, Jesus came to this earth, both God and human. And he walked a human life 33 years and he, he began and finished his race. And he did it by keeping his eyes forward on what was ahead of him. He could put up with anything that came his way. And it's saying, study, it's telling us, study how he did it, because this is what you're supposed to do. He is our role model. Now here's the first blank on your note sheet. Steadfast faith. Steadfast faith. And as we talk about this, just, just kind of evaluate where you are in this process. This is a faith that remains consistent no matter what challenges life throws your way. And that's not always easy. I know it isn't. I've had a few myself that have just really um, could have set me back. But I was, I was hard-headed enough and resolute enough to just keep plugging away with Jesus one that remains consistent no matter what challenges throws your way. So I want to, I'm just really setting some groundwork up so I can get to the real, uh, real story of the um, message. But here's a few obvious things I want to state. They're on your note sheet. Fill in the blank that God is real and the devil is real. We know that. You know that. John 10.10 10 is a great example. It lists both God's role and the devil's role. The thief comes to steal kill and destroy, but Jesus came that we could have life and have it abundantly. The second thing right there to fill in is we will face opposition, tribulation, and trouble. That's not a shocker. Most of us have already walked through those things. The, uh, the Lord warned us of it, First Peter 5, 8. He said, look, you've got to be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a, a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So, not ironic that he used the lion in this, in this uh, example or this scripture. A lion, he's the king of the jungle. He's, the, he's a mighty animal. He didn't say, be careful, there's a little kitty cat on the loose and he's going to try to trip you up. He, he warned us, he said, there's a real enemy and he's looking to devour you. So be on your guard, be watchful. So we all know that just, bec just because we've asked the Lord into our heart and we walk with him and we belong to Jesus does not mean that we're exempt from problems. It does not make them invisible or non-existent. But what it does mean is that we have someone that is gonna walk beside us. Every step of the way, when we go through those problems, and many times he's going to reach down, he's just going to carry us because we feel we're just too weak to do it on our own. He'll carry us. John 16, he sets it up. He said, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So he doesn't leave us hanging. He doesn't say, oh, it's bad. <laughs> it's a bad world out there and you're just going to have to figure it out. 
No, he sets it up by saying, look, I'm going to tell you all this because I want you to have peace. Before I even say it, I want you to be able to have peace and hope. There's going to be times when things happen that you don't know what is happening. And he says, I want you to take heart, be of good cheer, because I've already won the war. I've already overcome the world. And when he's in us, then we can say we overcome too, because he overcame. We know life isn't fair. It doesn't always give us good things. And just like Amara said in the video, bad things happen to good people. And it just stinks, because it's just not fair. But I want to give you some keys today real quick on the note sheet to help you know how to walk steadfast in your faith when those things come to you. I'm going to go quick because I want to get to um, the rest of the, the story. So number one, and I'm not going to read all the, script, uh, the scriptures because they're there for you to take home and read. Number one is to know God. We have to know God. And you may be in here today and you say, I've never really made that decision I've never asked him to be the Lord of my life, but you can. You can today. It is really necessary that we know God to live in victory in this world. Number two, to live a steadfast and immovable, you have to know the word of God. Psalm 119, 105 does say, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. So when you go in a room and it's dark, you just stumble around even if you know where the bed is and the dresser is, you might have forgot about that shoe or that Lego or something that is in the floor, and you can't see it, so you step on it. You get tripped up. This word is the light for our journey. When we don't know and we feel like we're stumbling around, stepping all over every kind of thing, in our case, a suitcase. We've been on a couple of trips, and we'd leave the suitcase in there, and Brent's, of course, not mine, is in the doorway... And I about hit it. And I can even, we can't, we can't grope around in the darkness and be successful. We have to know the word. This isn't something we just stand up here as leaders or teachers and say, read your Bible because I know you have nothing else to do. You need to read your Bible so that you know what God says. So that when we're on the tightrope of life that we're fixing to talk about, you have something to pull from. And you can get something out that you need it. Three is trust God. That's a no-brainer. We all have those people in our life. If they were to tell us, hey, crawl up on the, the corner of that roof and jump down, I'm going to have a safety net there for you. It's going to be fun. It'll bounce you up, and it'll be great. You trust them enough that you know if you went and got on the roof and you jumped off, there would be a safety net there. And then there are some people in your life that say, hey, go jump off that roof. I'll put a safety net there. Don't worry. And you're thinking, not a chance. I don't. You have good intentions, but you have not followed through with things in the past, and I can't trust you. So you have to have a relationship where you trust what God has said so that you can be successful. The next one, don't lose sight of where you're headed. Don't quit. <laughs> don't quit. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary while we're doing good, for there's going to come a time that we're going to reap if we don't lose heart. But we quit too easy. It's too hard. I'm tired. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm done. Done. And sometimes when a person feels like they're done, there's nothing you can do or say to change their mind. They're done. Don't quit. And the last one, shocker, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because he will show you how to put up with anything along the way. Isn't that what Hebrews 1 verse 2 said? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because he knew where he was headed, he could put up with anything. And he will show you how to do it. Okay, so I want to just talk real quick about in the book. It's not supposed to be this way in our Bible study. Lisa Turkhurst referenced two gardens. And I give her the props and the credit, but I'm going to use it because it's a great illustration. And then I added a visual. I'm a visual person. So I added a visual of my own to help my group, my ladies, understand. So over here, we've got the Garden of Eden. And we know it was made in a perfect state. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. 
He separated the sky from the ground. He made heaven and earth. He took all the waters that were just everywhere, and he brought them all in, and he drew a boundary line, and he says, you can only come this far. You're the ocean, you're the sea, the rest is dry land. He put all of the lighting in the sky, sun, moon, the stars, to give us day and night. He created all the animals that walk on the, the ground, all of them that are in the water. He even created man from the dust of the earth, and he sat back at the end of day six, and he said, man, this is good. It's not just good, this is perfect. In Genesis 2, he decided, Adam might be getting a little lonely. I need to give him a talkative woman to come alongside him and keep him company. So he created Eve to be his helpmate. And again, God said, man, this is good. Those are some beautiful people. And they have everything they want. All the food they need, all the, the um, provision they need except clothes, obviously at that time they didn't need any, so it didn't matter, did it? No sickness, no tears, no addictions. It was perfect. And here comes the devil, in like he does to us every day. With his lies and with his temptation. And see, one thing, the reason you need to know the word of God is because the devil knows the word of God. But what he does is he takes the scripture and he twists it in a lie form. And he comes to you and gets you to fall for what he's saying because it sounds grand and it sounds easier than being steadfast. And, we, and Adam and Eve did. They listened. Because of that, sin entered the world. Then came punishment. Then came consequences. And somewhere along this line, we go to the far garden over here, which is heaven. This is, that's where it all started. This is where it all ends. Guess what? The perfect paradise that will never be tainted, that will never lose its perfection. And here in the middle, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him and know him could end up in heaven in the world of perfection again. What he first wanted us to live in always. That's why we have to know God. But in the process of getting from this garden to this garden, my visual for myself is, I just figure that there's a big, my, my life is a big um, tightrope. So I'm walking life on the tightrope. And some days, it's easy, and I'm just going right along like I am a professional tightrope walker. And bam, the summer of 2008 comes, and you get a call that your dad's been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And oh my God, I fall off that rope because I didn't see that one coming, and I grab onto it. And, and I hold on, and I'm just like, oh my God, what? What do I do? Because I have implemented the keys of being steadfast in my life, I go to the Word and I say, I know trouble's going to come, but I know I have a God that's faithful and He's going to walk with me. And I put that on my tightrope a little bit in front of me, that He is my peace, He is my hope, and I'm going to walk in that promise. And He reaches down and He picks me up and he sets me back on the tightrope. And some days, he just picks me up, and he just carries me, and he walks it. Because you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. But that's really not an option. Because life brings trials and sorrows. So I have to cling to the hope that God gives me. Even though I walked through that six months, God never left my side. He was my strength. He was my comfort. The only walk on, I'm, keep, I'm, I'm back on my feet, walking along. And bam, 2013 comes and Uncle Sam doesn't like the way our taxes looked. 
Not in that year, not in 15, not in 17. I knew it was a spiritual attack. But when I go to the mailbox one day and I see a notice saying uh, we owe over $10,000, I'm thinking your first human thought is, I don't have that kind of money to, I, oh my God, oh my God. No. Looked at Brent. What did we do? We went to the Word and we said, we are tithers and we are in covenant with God. And because of that, he said he would pour out blessings on us that we couldn't even contain. He would rebuke the devourer for our sake and, and all the nations of the world would look at us and call us delightful. God, we're delightful. And you know what? If we owe that money, we're going to pay it and God, you will provide every penny we need. And if we don't owe that money, then we come against this right now and you're going to set it straight. And he did. We didn't pay over $10,000. We paid some thousands, but not over ten. But the, the wonderful thing, because on this tightrope of getting letters and getting, you know, notices, and they try to scare you. I mean, I'm, that's their job, I guess, to make you know they're serious. We're going to have to start garnishing. I'm like, oh, no, you're not going to take my stuff. Because I'm a tither and God's going to provide and we're going to pay you. And we did. We walked. And every time we had to make a payment, I didn't go to, a, I didn't go to the credit card. I didn't borrow money. I sat on a road to check out on my account because God had made sure it was in my account. And I just followed that tightrope and looking at my promise. I kept my eyes on Jesus. I knew where I was going. And I didn't lose sight. You can do this but it's not always easy. But you can do this. And I want to tell you about two animals as we close. And this part does pain me just a little bit because the animal that God so, um, I don't know, <laughs> humorously, decided to use and what I wanted to um, give this illustration is the bulldog. <laughs> and I don't really like bulldogs. <laughs> not real ones or not Nederland ones. I just don't <laughs> like bulldogs. <laughs> I love my friends from Nederland, but I just, I don't think they're a very attractive animal. <laughs> Do you? No, they're not. They look much better. An Indian head is such a more beautiful sight. But unfortunately, the Indian is not the, uh, doesn't give us the great example right here. And I want to tell you, on the bottom of your shirt, ladies, there is an icon for a bulldog head. And it hurt me really bad to put it on there. In fact, Brent was so, when he saw this shirt, Jesse, he said, what is that? Why do you have a bulldog on your, you know, none of your poor nature's ladies are going to wear that shirt. I'm like, it's because I want them to have a bulldog faith, not be for the Nederland Bulldogs. There is a bulldog on here because I want you to remember these things about having a bulldog faith. Number one, um, it's going to be on the screen. It's not on your note sheet. If you want to jot it down, it'd be good because this is a really good, good qualities to, to adapt in your faith. Bulldogs are aggressive persistent, and determined. A bulldog will lay hold of what it belongs to and it won't let go. Bulldog faith would be one that is persistent. To stay with your situation in spite of the difficulty or the opposition, you need to apply a non-stop relentless pressure on your situation. A bulldog faith is obstinate. See, I knew those bulldogs were hard-headed. <laughs> There's that word again, hard-headed. But you need, and, and when you're talking about having a faith, that's what you've got to be. Don't give up until you get what you want. Because see, here's the thing how a bulldog is made. A bulldog has a protruding jaw, and his nose is indented. And this enables him to grab onto, bite onto something, and still keep breathing. Let that sink in for just a minute. When you're going through life, 
and you're going to have this kind of faith. You're going to find something in this word right here that you can bite into. And you are going to hold on to it. And you're going to breathe all the while walking every day. One step at a time. Because you've put that promise down here and you're going to keep your eyes focused on that promise. And you're going to breathe all the while while going day to day. Still muddling through that situation that just seems to not obey the word yet. Not let, you know, but you're not going to let it go. Because you're going to have a bulldog faith. And you're going to look at this shirt, ladies, when you wear it. And you're going to remember on those hard days. I'm going to stay the course. And I am not going to let go until I get what God says I can have. I will not do it. I will keep, I will keep it. Let me tell you about one other animal. It's the cheetah. And the cheetah, while he looks all that and more, this big slender cat that chases his prey on the African plains can run up to 70 miles an hour. Think of that driving alongside your car. If you're driving 70, a cheetah can keep up with your vehicle. But the thing about the cheetah is, in his beautiful long body, he has a disproportionately small heart. And because of that, he tires really fast. So if he doesn't catch his prey on the first flurry, he has to abandon the chase. And he doesn't get what he was after. Sometimes as Christians, we think we're going to face our problems that way. We're going to start fast. We're going to go. We're going to run harder. We're going to get it. But we don't get it right away. And it's just too hard to keep going. We tire. We tire. Because we don't have stamina to sustain us in the, in the race. So I just want to tell you today. The keys to steadfastness we talked about will condition your heart to have the stamina you need to stay steadfast no matter what life throws at you. And the last scripture on your sheet says, my heart is steadfast, oh God. You can come on up, Pastor John. My heart is steadfast, so I will sing and give praise. You can do this.